All right, well, welcome. I'm going to give you a little um, overview of Highwood Health Retreat and some of the things we're doing in Australia. Um, this is currently, and it is after the fire. Just to keep everything straight. <laughs> I was not there at the time of the fire. Well, the Highwood campus was spared. Well, you know why, don't you? The fire came within half a mile, about one kilometer from our campus on one side. There was two fires that day, and they were going to converge. If you look at the trajectories of the fires, they were going to converge. And the other fire was on the mountain on the other side, probably less than a kilometer from us also. I think that the two fires were going to converge on Highwood. I think the devil was aiming to destroy Highwood. That was one of his aims. He probably had other aims as well. But just at the last second, last minute or two, whatever, the wind changed and blew the fires the other direction. 276 people, I think it is, lost their lives, burned alive in their cars, in their homes, in what, because some, some places like King Lake, the fire came up so fast that people didn't even hear a siren or a warning or even a radio announcement about the fire until after it had passed through their town. That happened in several, several towns. They've really upgraded the fire warning system in Victoria, as you can imagine, as a result of that fire. But it was a a lot of damage, and we're, we were in the fire zone because that's where the fire, like I said, it was within, both fires were within about a half a kilometer from us, and they were headed our way, and um, some of our staff, it, this is all before I got involved with Highwood um, in, a, in, in the capacity that I'm involved now. I used to go there and, and um, teach classes when there was a small school there, which went defunct a little bit. Well, a couple of years, well, I'd say now about five years ago, six years ago, something like that. And um, I used to teach there, and I used to go around and preach with some of their staff in various places in Australia. So I knew them well. I knew the people there very well, and of course, I heard the stories. And some of you would have listened to the CD I did on the fire, yeah. in which I described the fire in rather graphic detail from news reports and consolidated them into a story that, um, a prophetic story actually, that helped us to grasp what things are going to be like. But anyway, this is Highwood and um, I want to uh, share with you a few things. Let me just uh, show you our, the, the, the road that goes by the front of our property. This is the Maroondah Highway. This is one of the most beautiful forests on the planet with the tall eucalyptus trees that go up 100 feet in the sky. And they have a canopy at the top, but not a lot of, not a, not a lot of branches and things coming off along the way up. So they're just these straight poles of tree trunk and then with a canopy up there. So you can see through the forest and it's absolutely beautiful because coming out of the ground are these giant tree ferns. As you can see, they drape their giant fronds over the road and it's just gorgeous. Driving through there is absolutely gorgeous. Some of them grow to be 30 feet high. Some of these, I've even seen them as high as 40 feet, but most of them are only about 30 feet. Uh, I say most of the, the, the highest ones that I can see are mostly about 30 feet. The others, everything in between, of course, from the ground up. Um, so it's a beautiful place, it's, and it's because of all the rain, that's why it's so beautiful. It's, um, there's a lot of rain in this area, and the mountain draws the clouds. So we get, unfortunately, it's the one thing I don't like about Highwood, we get a lot of clouds and a lot of rain at certain times of the year. But it is a beautiful place, and it's a restful place. This is Highwood Health Retreat for those of you who haven't seen it. Those of you who have probably recognize this picture. Um, that mountain behind is where the fire was, all right? And then coming up toward where I am in relation to this, about a kilometer away, is the other fire. Um, or was the other fire. You can still go there and see the burned out trees or dark 
uh, black trunks of the trees where they were burned. We lost a lot of wildlife in the fire. And the wildlife, I think, is still recovering, though it's starting to come back. We have wallabies and kangaroos on our property, but not too many, thank God. <laughs> and we have loads and loads of parrots, colorful, beautifully colorful parrots. Uh, also, we have, um, well, they're, they're also part of the parrot family, the um, cockatoos, you know, the famous cockatoo with his uh, yellow, the males have the yellow uh, crest. And uh, we have the black cockatoos, we have the gang gang parrots, we have, th those are fairly rare, both the black cockatoos and the gang gang parrots. Um, we have uh, lots of other wildlife, everything from wombats to um, beautiful little, um, little birds, uh, beautiful colorful little birds. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, snakes, we do have some snakes. And every snake in Australia is poisonous. There are no non-poisonous snakes in Australia. If there are, I don't know about them. <laughs> so, come on down. <laughs> the, straight, the, the snakes are more afraid of you than you are of them. So, off they go into the forest. This is near Melbourne, which is in the south, in Victoria. Um, and by the way, let me teach you how to say Melbourne. It's not Melbourne as it's spelled. It's Melbourne. No, no, no. It's not Melbin, no. like, like uh, some kind of a bin, but it's Melbin, like Benjamin, Melbin, okay? No. And you say it fast, Melbourne. No, no, no. Okay, what was that? Like can, that's right, cans, it's not cairns, it's cans. <laughs> and Brisbane is Brisbane. Okay, so there you go. You, you got your first lesson in the Australian language. And um, they shorten everything, so, you know, it's good day. <laughs> and, uh, huh? Ah, oh, good day, mate. Yep, that's right. Anyway, okay, so this is the health retreat. It has 13 guest rooms at the moment. We are in the process of renovating it. We had a therapy department that was uh, divided into, well, it was a 33 by 35 room building one room inside this building and it had divided in half men's and ladies duplicate equipment and whatever and it was very inefficient and not private because when you talk to people spiritually often it happens during therapy okay and you need privacy because they don't want to talk when there's other people around so it had plumbing problems it had some dry rot it had drainage issues it had all kind of issues and so finally we came to the point where we said the only way we're going to really solve this problem is if we completely gut it, redesign it, and put it all back together. We're just finishing that up this week. It started the beginning of December. It's taken us four months, but it's been a very, very blessed four months to work together. We had volunteers from all over. We had volunteers from Britain, Germany, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, United States, Canada, at seven. Seven countries. And uh, God sent us builders, tilers, plumbers, electricians, and general labor. <laughs> cooks. You've got to have cooks if you're going to have volunteers. You've got to feed them, right? If you don't feed them, they're not going to work. <laughs> we had a wonderful time. I'll show you some pictures of it later. Anyway, it's almost done now. It's got four treatment rooms that are, um, you know what? If you just give me a second, I might be able to find a picture of this for you. I'm going to show you the, the, uh, the layout of this. Um, there we go. That's the floor plan. We have four treatment rooms. Is there a long stick? Huh? You can see them up at the top, one on the left, one on the right, you see the massage tables, and then coming down to the left and coming down to the right, there's two more massage tables. Okay, so each, those are the four rooms. Each is private, and each has a core therapy. On the top left, you have two tubs, you see that? That's for hot and cold. So you put them in the hot tub for a while, and then you put them in the cold tub for a few seconds while they can stand it, okay? And then you put them back in the hot tub for a while, 
It works really well. Um, they consider it to be torture. <laughs> and then the next one down below, you see the little sits baths in the corner. That's our sits bathroom. It also has a toilet so that if we have to do some kind of um, enema or something, we have the ability to do it right there privately in the room. And then up in the top right-hand corner is a hot infrared sauna, dry sauna, along with the table. And then in this next room below, you see the contrast shower between them. That, that's a, that contrast shower is controlled by the therapist. The temperature is controlled by the therapist. It has 12 heads, I think it is. 12 shower heads. So we can really, you know, go at them. <laughs> And then there's a Russian steam bath down there at the, the one below. Um, and then in the middle you can see there's a uh, steam room. And the steam room is of course uh, a larger room where we can fit about eight or nine people perhaps to do the steam bath. We have laundry and toilet and facilities here at the bottom and the entryway. You come in at the bottom here and you have a reception desk with a refrigerator and ice machine. And, and uh, over here on the right hand side, you see the hallway going up on the right hand side? Right there, that is the hydroculator. You know what a hydroculator is? That's where we put our um, fomentations. So if you've got a problem, you can treat it with fomentations. Fomentations are hot packs that are used a lot of times in physiotherapy, designed for uh, healing. Anyway, there you are. That's the floor plan that's just about finished. Actually, we made a few changes to it. Um, but that's basically the, the idea, and that's pretty much what it is. All right. Now that you've seen and read all my emails, <laughs> like the NSA, <laughs> might as well. What difference does it make? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Everything's open. The wing out to the right, that's our uh, reception and office area. That's going to get remodeled next. Um, we have to have more offices. We only have a handful, a couple of offices, and we've got a lot of people that need offices, so we're kind of uh, really hard up for offices. So we're going to be changing a few things in that part of the building. We want to bring a fitness center out under the portico um, and glass it all in so that people can be watching, looking at the birds and the trees and whatever else, beautiful lawn out there, um, as they exercise during inclement weather. Oh, by the way, we have the kookaburra. You know what the kookaburra is? That's the laughing kookaburra, the one that laughs. It's not a part of the parrot family. It's another, it's, it's, it's almost on its own, I don't know. <laughs> but they will, they'll wake you up at 5.30 in the morning outside your window. It's wonderful sound, it's a weird sound. And you think, wow, what is that when you first hear it? But you know something, you very quickly warm to it and you, you almost miss it when you don't hear it. We have kookaburras all over the place. There's another wing going out the other way that has the kitchen and the dining area. And we're also, going, phase three of our renovations includes the kitchen area as well as the offices. So we are um, needing to have volunteers again in December and January of this year, this, this coming December and January to help renovate the uh, remaining bits and pieces that we still have to do. We're running therapy, se or, yeah, we're running therapy sessions right now, so we really can't, we can't do a lot of renovations when the guests are there. December is ideal because nobody wants to come to a health retreat in December, or January for that matter. You know why? Because they have families to go to. It's Christmas and New Year's, and you know, it's a, who wants to go and go to a health retreat? That's the summertime then, too. It's also when people are starting their holidays. And uh, so we can usually start the programs about the middle of January again. Um, but uh, we didn't this year because we wanted more time to do our, our renovations. And we probably won't next year as well until the beginning of February. Then we'll start. But during December and January. So if you want to come and, and enjoy Australia and do something worthwhile for the Lord, come on down and help us. December, roughly December 1 is when we'll start the project. Comfort, you can come, and by the way, it's easy to get a visa. You come as a visitor, okay, and they're electronic, and you get them instantaneously. It's not like you have to go through a lot of formalities. 
The medical missionary work promises to do more in Australia than it has in America to open the way for the truth to gain access to the people. Now, folks, what do you think that means? I wondered why. Why does Ellen White say that it'll do more in Australia than in America? What was that? I thought about it for a while. Finally, I think I figured it out. The people in Australia are more secular than the people in America. Most people in America go to church. They get their, their religious caffeine, pick me up, on Sunday morning. They think they've had enough religion for the week. They don't need any other religion. They're already religious. So we don't need any more. They get an emotional feeling and they think they've been satisfied. They don't realize that they don't have the truth. And the truth is just as important as your emotional nature. So, but in Australia, the, most Australians have never had any religious background at all. They're very secular to begin with. So their resistance is to religion or Christianity in general, not specific to Adventism. Okay? That's the bottom line, I think. So they come to our health retreat with their barriers up. You know, we don't want religion crammed down our throat. Well, you don't have to worry. That's not what we'll do. But you know something? After about three days, the barriers start to break down. And you know what happens? God moves in on them, and it is fantastic to watch what God does. I am absolutely amazed as I watch God work. And I get the stories because my Bible worker is very faithful in giving me updates on what happens with our guests. And I'm amazed. Uh, we had one lady come in October. She had depression and I don't know, some other things, other health problems. She said, I'm not going to come to your spiritual emphasis meetings, which is twice a day, morning and evening, that otherwise known as worship. You know, in America, you can say worship. You can talk about worship. People understand that, what that means. But if you say that to an Australian, you call it worship, you know what they're going to say? Oh, is this a religious indoctrination? You know, nah. So we just call it spiritual emphasis. Because we are physical, mental, and spiritual people. We, we orient them and help them understand that's what we do. That's what we are. So we have, she said, I'm not going to come because she said, I don't believe in God. That's fine, okay. Everything is voluntary. You know, you can pay your money and come and not do anything if you want. It's okay. So she didn't come to the spiritual emphasis, at least for four days. <laughs> on the fourth day, she said to Stina, our Bible worker, they were walking out on a walk, and she said, you know, she said, I'm learning a lot. She said, but... You know, I'm frustrated. Hang on, that wasn't Steen, it was the, the manager. She said, I'm frustrated. She said, I, I am getting a lot of information from all these things that you're telling us, but she says, everything has God in it, and I don't believe in God. So the manager, her name was Judy, she said, would you like me to show you from the Bible proof that God exists? The Bible itself, that proof Proof that God exists and that he's interested in the affairs of men. Well, she wasn't quite ready for that. But the next day, she was walking with Stina. She said, you know, I think I'll take her up on that. I'd better at least be willing to hear what she has to say, what the Bible says about that. So she went straight to Judy and she said, all right, I'll take you up. So this was Friday. Friday night, they had a Bible study. Now, if you, had, if you were going to tell somebody proof from the Bible that God exists, where would you go? Huh? Daniel what? No. That's, well, it's not where she took her. Maybe you... There's probably a lot of places you could take. I don't mean to... Uh, <laughs> where do you think she took her? No. No. You were close, Daniel. Daniel, chapter... Two, that's right. Daniel chapter 2. Why Daniel chapter 2? Well, 
God said this is what's going to happen, and then you can look at history and you can see that it happened. It's a great place to show people that God actually exists from the Bible itself and prove it. Because Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar saw it all. Okay. So they went and they did a study on Daniel 2. And she was very impressed by that. And then Sabbath morning, they watched a video on creation, which is the second place you go when you talk about religion and God and origins, because everybody wants to know where they're from and where we're going. And uh, they did a creation video. Then um, in the afternoon, Judy said to her, would you like to go out on the lawn with a blanket and sit in the sun for a while and relax? Yeah, let's do that. She said, would you like to bring a book along to read? You know, she said, yeah, yeah, I would. She said, I never thought I heard my, I'd hear myself say this, but she says, I'd like to bring a Bible. She took a Bible and read 14 chapters of something. I don't know what it was, but she, read, she enjoyed it. Um, later on that day, they went for a walk, a whole bunch of them. They went up on the mountain, went for a walk in one of the places around there. And she was again walking with Stina. She said, Stina, she said, there's one thing I'd like to do. If there's one thing I'd like to take home with me from Highwood, it would be this idea, this concept of the Sabbath. This is a woman who doesn't believe in God. She says, I'd like to take home this concept of the Sabbath. I would like to take off one day of work a week and just go out in nature and enjoy nature. But she said, you know, my friends, they don't respect this day like you do. Well, Stina was quick on her feet. She said, you can come spend it with us. <laughs> oh, she said, that's a good idea. Well, later that night, she was caught red-handed reading her Bible again. And she said to the manager the next day, she said, you know, my prayers are already being answered. I mean, <laughs> this is the woman who came a week before who didn't believe in God. But friends, the fact is, the Holy Spirit is working on these people's minds and hearts. The Holy Spirit doesn't stop. They've got gaping holes in their hearts because they've got a lot of pain, a lot of issues in their lives. And they don't know how to handle it. They don't know the search for meaning. They don't know where to go for it. They look for everything in Buddhism, Hinduism, and all sorts of other isms. And they can't find it. The, the holes just get bigger. But when they finally realize that God loves them through the loving care of other human beings that love God, the barriers start to come down. And when they come down, they are wide open. They don't have these Baptist barriers to Adventism. They don't have Pentecostal errors to, to ri rival Adventist teaching. They don't have all this background. They, they're just wide open. And the Lord just blesses them. Anyway, that's the story of that. Now let's see what happened to our picture again. Something wiggles, and that I think it's the wiggles. I've got to watch that. Make sure I don't wiggle the podium. Okay, good. Uh... Well, okay. There we go. That's the front entrance. We're, this is where we want to put our fitness uh, area and redesign this entrance so that um, we can have a much better uh, utilization of the space. Here's another statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. Sanitariums or lifestyle health retreats should be established near such cities as Melbourne and Adelaide. A lady came to me the other day, maybe a month or two ago. Huh? Oh, oh, sorry. A lady came to me the other day. She said, Pastor Mayor, ever since you showed me that statement from medical ministry work about Adelaide, she says, I can't get it out of my mind. She lives about three or four hours north of Adelaide in a place called Port Augusta. She said, I would love to be involved in starting a health retreat in Adelaide. She said, what do we need to do? So we sat down and talked. I said, well, maybe God has a plan here. You may, I don't know whether God wants it now or later, but we could at least do some groundwork and see what's going on, how to, how to navigate the whole idea. Well, anyway, not only that, I, in, in the back of my mind, I have another factor. I know that there is a doctor in Madelaide who's a good friend of ours. She comes and provides some help for us once, in a, once a year or twice a year. 
uh, at Highwood, and we've known her for a year. She's a young woman that's a natural, she's a, she's a regular allopathic doctor that believes in natural remedies. She, her full-time practice is dealing with women's health issues through natural means. She probably, I think that she could well be the foremost doctor in all of Australia who understands how to handle women's health issues with natural means. Anyway, she is um, there and she'd love to start a health retreat. So I called her up. I talked to her about it. She said, oh, she said, I'd quit my practice tomorrow if we had a health retreat. She said, we'd just move everything right over there and we'd just do that. So she has already gotten on the stick. Just this week before I left Australia on Sunday, I told her, I spoke with her, and I spoke to her since I got back as well. She's already started to investigate suitable properties that could work for a health retreat near Adelaide and already checking with the county, otherwise known as the council, to see what can be done and so on. And it's a little challenging, but, you know, Satan is, while we've been sleeping, while our health retreats have been defunct and not working, Satan has been stealing a march and hedging up the way. So now we have to have the miracle of God to open it up because the councils there are very strict about the kind of, biz- the kind of activities you can do in, in these areas. They don't want, in, in residential areas, they don't want businesses, you know, because of traffic and noise and uh, who knows what else. But this is not the kind of business that you'd normally have. It's not an open shop where people come and go all the time. They come once, stay for a few days, five to ten days, whatever, and then go home again. It's not like they're, they're constantly coming and going, although health retreats can have a lot of busy times. But there, it's not the kind of business that is designed as a f- storefront. You know, it's, not, it's a different kind. So I don't know if we can work around it or what, but we'll, by the grace of God, he can open the door if he wants us to start a health retreat in Melbourne or in Adelaide. Highwood is in Victoria, which is near Melbourne. We are the only Adventist residential health retreat in Victoria. Therefore, that statement is talking about Highwood. And maybe others down the line. Melbourne's got four million people. And and one out of three or one out of four are depressed. And they have other health issues. And they're all aging like here in America. The population is generally aging, and therefore they have more health issues, more health problems. So they need more health retreats than just what Highwood has to offer. But anyway, that's one thing that may come down the line. Oh, We do therapies of various types. That's a Russian steam bath. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a massage. That's one of the guest rooms that's now been repainted. They get lectures. They get good, nutritious, natural foods. Those greens and things are from our garden, which is there. You, list, you see the garden and the orchard in the back and the raised beds in the front. We do lots of, lots of produce. And right now, it's all on. All the harvest is on right now. Well, not all, but a lot of it. Another picture of the garden. There's the vineyard. Oh, come on. There we go. We had beautiful grapes. We have lovely grapes at at, uh, table grapes at our place. And up at the top, you see the denser bushes at the top. Those are blackberries. We had a bumper crop of blackberries this year. Greens. We use lots of greens to make green drinks. I think I told you that before. And we also use lemons. We have about 20 lemon trees. We're not so high. We're only about 1,300 feet. Um, We can grow some citrus there, actually. Lemons, mandarins, and uh, some grapefruits at the moment. But we have about 20 lemon trees. You know, you need lemons for your health. Drink your lemon juice. Oh, this is the supervisor of the farm. That's a kookaburra. That's the kookaburra. This one is rather friendly. He will eat... Worms and grubs and other ugly things out of your hand. <laughs> or he'll catch them if you throw them up in the air. He'll fly up and catch them. And he watches everything that goes on in the garden. He's keeping an eye on everything. And the parrots, they're around too. They love to come and beg for something to eat. 
They like it when you hand it to them in your hand. They'll land. I've had them land on my arm and shoulder and eat right out of my hand. This is the school building. It has a three-bedroom apartment, classrooms, offices, library, and it needs renovation badly. So that's one of our projects. It's not my priority right now, but it is a, pro it is a project that will be happening down the line. So get your wings on. Come on down and help us. That's uh, the dormitory, the newest building on campus. We can sleep 18, uh, sorry, uh, 16 students. There's 16 beds in there, eight rooms. And uh, right now we basically use it for staff and visitors and volunteers. Um, at uh, each end is a, an apartment wing that goes out the back for deans. And we have staff living in there now. And then also the um, main wing in the middle comes out with um, a commercial kitchen and a multi-purpose dining room. And that is a very um, useful building for us. We had our literature project this last month there, a 10-day literature project. We distributed 33,000 pieces of literature, maybe 35,000 pieces of literature. 12,000 last generation magazines, five, uh, sorry, 10,000 or 11,000 Steps to Christ, and um, a pamphlet on Luther, about 10,000 copies of a pamphlet on Luther commemorating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, which is coming up in October of 2017. You're going to hear more about that in the press over the next few years because Rome is determined to shut down the Reformation. And she already has, really. She just has to bring the churches back together. So the ecumenical appeal under Francis is timed perfectly for the 2007 17 anniversary of the birth of the Reformation to commemorate its death 500 years later. You understand what I'm saying? Anyway, the pamphlet leads right into Adventist doctrine, so it's a real strategic piece. Um, it was printed in Norway, and we had two volunteers come from Norway, uh, as well as volunteers from all around Australia. And we had one volunteer from America as well. And we worked the streets, and we also did letterboxing, putting literature in people's mailboxes in the residential communities. You're allowed to do that in Australia, where you're not allowed to do that here in America. But in Australia, you can do it. So we would hand out literature in the, in the mailboxes so that people would have it. Anyway, uh, but the street was where the real dynamic thing was going on. Oh, my, that was incredible. 20 volunteers... Most of them spread out on the street. Hundreds of people come by every minute. We had, um, well, I ended up working at the table because nobody else wanted to work the table. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll manage the table while you all go spread out. So I was standing there by the table where we have our supplies and handing out literature to people as they came down the, the, the walk, the sidewalk. One group of people came along after the light changed and I started handing them literature. You know, you live for the minute when somebody takes one, you know, because most people just turn you down. You, don't have to, you can't be afraid of rejection. <laughs> it's not personal. Rejection is not personal at all. And uh, it's, um, uh, but it's, but you live for when somebody takes a piece of literature out of your hand. And a young woman came along and took a copy of Steps to Christ called Path to Peace. She went over to the mailboxes and dropped some mail in the mailbox, and then she stood there with her back to me, looking through the pamphlet one page at a time. And I started praying for her, Lord, touch her heart. Please touch her heart. I'm still handing out literature, watching out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> and I had to look away for a minute. Because of some things, I just did, you know, I had to keep doing what I was doing. When I looked back, she was standing right in front of me. I thought maybe she'd throw it in the trash can or uh, put it on the table. or I didn't know what she would do. But anyway, she was standing right in front of me. And she said, do you know a place where I can go, where they, like a Bible school where I can study the Bible? Well, I didn't know of any. I couldn't tell her I would because we don't have a Bible study school there. At least not at the moment, although I'd like to start one one day. But I said, I can connect you with someone who does study the Bible with people. 
Just then, Stina, our Bible worker, walked back to the table to reload her bag. I said, let me introduce you to Stina. <laughs> and the two of them just hit it off, just like that. Now they are actively studying the Bible. This woman is hungry. She wants to know what the Bible says. She says, I can't believe how much truth you can find out of the Bible. She said, and it's different. She says, different. When people tell me about Buddha or Hinduism or whatever, she says, it's not the same as when they tell you about Christianity. There's something different about it. She said, I got a boyfriend. I went to a Christian meeting, she said, a while back. She said, I, and my boyfriend is not a Christian. She said, and um, the Lord spoke to me. He said, you've got to put me first. And she said, you know, when I realized that, she says, I realized that it, I, I may have to let go of my boyfriend because we're not, we don't have the same mind on these things. Stina said, look, Matthew 6.33 says what? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Then she gave her Psalm 37, 4, which says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee desires of thine heart. You see? There's a Bible text for everything. <laughs> and she said, you know, but I have peace. I can trust God to take care of that, my love life, basically. I, I'm not quoting her exactly, but she said, I've, I had peace. When God told me he had to put me first, I had peace about my boyfriend. She said, and she realized that she is not... A, that's not God's will for her to have uh, intimate relationships with someone outside of marriage and so on and so on. You know how secular people live. So they're working together, very actively studying the Bible together. And um, other people came along. One woman came and she says, where can I get a Bible? I said, what kind of Bible do you want? Oh, I'd like to have an NIV. She said, I looked all over, this, all over the CBD, the Central Business, Downtown. She, and all the bookstores, none of them have Bibles in them. I said, well, I'll get you a Bible, but I said, I can probably get you, a, and I can probably get you a KJV. Her face fell. She said, oh, it's so hard to read. But she's been told, you know. I figured I'm going to lose this sale. I better save it somehow. I said, well, listen, let me see if I can find you an NKJV. <laughs> I don't really care for the NKJV, you understand. But it's better than the NIV. And at least that way we have a connection, right? I said, I'll get, she said, okay, I could take the NKJV. So we had to go find her an NKJV. That wasn't easy to find either. But we finally found an NKJV at the Adventist Book Center of all places. <laughs> Imagine that. But we could not, for some reason, we could not connect with her. Because of the, you know, the business and huffle and scuffle of the day, you know, all that sort of stuff. So we left it with the lady, the, the first lady who I told you about that wants to do Bible studies. She is working in a very high-end fashion shop down in Melbourne. Everybody knows where it is. She, she works there. So we gave it to her. Might as well get her being a missionary. She can give the Bible to the woman. So we connected and they connected and then she got her Bible. So already our young Bible student is doing witnessing, <laughs> at least a little bit. And get them started early, you know. Get them started right away sharing their faith. Otherwise they get lazy. They think that you don't have to. All right, anyway, God's hand is over Highwood. I'm no doubt about that in my mind. Amen. That is a full rainbow. I don't know why the picture didn't get the whole thing, but anyway, it didn't. You get the idea. This is our miracle bus. <laughs> I put out a, a, you know, when I first came in, into Highwood, I, I realized we need something that represents who we are. The little mini bus that we had is, is a, basically a tin roller skate. Falls into every pothole, gets blown around by the wind all the time. It's rather unsafe in my opinion. But anyway, that's all we had. And we had these ugly magnetic signs on it. I mean, if you want to promote something, you don't do it half-heartedly. So anyway, but we needed something that represents and something that's larger because only, it only handles about six people and we need something larger for larger groups of people and larger gatherings and so on. Anyway, so I looked around and, and I decided on one of these 
transit vans, Ford transit vans. They're the least expensive of the vans in that class. The others are the Mercedes <laughs> and the Fiat, which are maybe a third again the price. Anyway, I thought, well, Lord, maybe you can help us find one of these. I guesstimated that it would be about $30,000. So we made an appeal to our supporters and friends around the world, and God sent us the funds to be able to purchase a van like this. Well, it's not only that. You, you have to find them. There's plenty of these Ford Transit vans all around Australia. They're everywhere. But most of them are panel vans used by tradesmen, plumbers, electricians, builders, whatever. Uh, delivery boys, you know, all, delivery trucks, all sorts of things, you know, everything but passenger versions of this vehicle. They're, they're like finding needles in a haystack. I finally found one in Melbourne. I rang the fellow up. Do you still have that Ford Transit event? Yeah, we do, but the people are here signing the papers for it right now. <laughs> well, that, that's not God's van. It had about 80,000 kilometers on it. Not bad for, a, for about a three or four-year-old vehicle. So it wasn't bad, really. We would have bought that one. Would have been nice. But for whatever reason, that wasn't God's van for us, God's bus. I was to preach in Brisbane on an upcoming Sabbath. And before I flew up there, I looked on the Internet again, and two of these vans popped up on the Internet up in Brisbane. The timing couldn't have been perfect about two days before I was to leave for Brisbane. I rang up my friend that put me, picked me up up there, and I said, can you take me to see these vans? Yeah, sure, he said. So we went off Friday afternoon to see these vans. There were two of them in one shop or one dealer. We looked at them. They're both 2005. They already had eight years of depreciation. One of them had about 75,000 Ks, which is about uh, 35,000 miles. Not bad. They were both very clean, very nice vehicles. This one had 21,600 kilometers, which is about 13,000 miles, eight years. Nobody ever drove it. It's brand new. It's diesel, automatic diesel, by the way. Diesel. It's barely broken in. I said, Lord, is this the van? We made a deal, and I drove it back to Victoria. That was a long haul. <laughs> But anyway, that's the van. We put license, uh, inspection, registration, a new windshield, and all the decals on it for just $30,000, plus transportation down to Highwood, you know, with all the diesel fuel. And I had to overnight in a hotel, whatever. And, you know, so all those costs, everything, God gave it to us for under, just under $30,000. It's our little miracle bus, and we just love it. It goes everywhere. It's even, get this, it even has in it a wheelchair lift. Amen. Seats 10 people, has a wheelchair lift, and we've already used the wheelchair lift. That's another four or $5,000 installed in terms of value. Brand new, hardly ever used. This house is a home that uh, has been converted to a duplex. We're systematically going through and upgrading all of our homes and uh, renovating them so that they are top class. Uh, well, top class. I, I mean, so that there's no mold, no rotting boards, <laughs> no, uh, you know, new flooring, new kitchens, um, you know, because they dilapidated over the years. They haven't been maintained properly. So we have to go back now and restore them. And this was a five-bedroom dormitory that was once used before the, the new dormitory was built. And so it's just too big. We don't have families that big at Highwood. So we're dividing them into duplexes. We have two of these. And this one's completed. This one is the next one to be done. That's another five-bedroom unit that's going to get in, uh, divided into a duplex. And then we'll have uh, additional staff housing. This is a picture from Google of our campus. Now let's see if I can show you some things. There we go. That's the health retreat right there. That's the school building. That's the main entrance, and that's the main road going by. This is the farm up here. This is the two homes that are getting renovated into duplexes. This is another duplex at the top, and that's the dormitory. And the property line runs about like this, and then right along here, up to there, over there, and then down, this, down along that road there.
Manby Road. Manby Road goes way out. It's a very nice place to walk out in the forest. After the few residential houses, it's all just open forest. And so it's very lovely. Over here on this side, this is all state forest. We're, our property butts right up against state forest, so we're not going to have anybody crowding in too much. There's two people that live right there and there. This one here, the people are never there, hardly, maybe once a year for a week or so. This person lives here all the time. He's a single man. His wife doesn't like to live out there, but he does, so they don't live together. She lives in the city. He lives out there. He came over to us the other day. He said, if we have a fire, you see in Australia, you have to have a fire plan. And the fire plan predominantly consists of um, going to a place. When there's a threat of a fire, you go to an open field. Okay? And in most towns, they have these ovals where they play sports, various types. So people go there. And the fire doesn't, you know, it's not such a dangerous place then. It, you know, but under the trees, forget it. You, you, <laughs> big trouble. So you get out from, a, so we have a lot of open space, as you can see. So if there's a fire, people can come there and they can, they, you know, he said, he said, would it be all right if I jumped the fence if there's a fire? Would you, would you mind if I jumped the fence? No, we said, by all means, come over the fence, do whatever you got to do. <laughs> See, during the fires, people, these neighbors, these neighbors said to people, that, that, that Highwood place there, God spared them. And they're very thankful because they got spared too. They recognized, because we're a Christian organization, and they know us. And there's people across the street. Let me see. This home right here. I've been up to this home to talk to these people. They have horses. They're, they're into horsemanship. And right across, along this, along this road, along the Marunda Highway, is what is the equivalent of the Appalachian Trail. You know the Appalachian Trail goes from Maine to Georgia? We, this starts right here where Highwood is at a place called Healesville, which is our nearest community, well, not our nearest community, it's the nearest Adventist church to us in Healesville, which is down, the, down this way a bit. It starts in Healesville, and it goes for 3,000 kilometers all the way up to North Queensland. And it goes right in front of our property. So people come by there all the time on their horses and hikers and all kind of people. Anyway, very interesting. I don't know how I can use that yet, but God works. This lady was baptized, the one in the center, Wendy. We've had other people that are now doing Bible studies. We're doing follow-up. We have a Bible worker that works with our, our guest alumni on a regular basis. It's a huge blessing. Okay, quickly, this is a renovation project. This fellow came from Britain. We're tearing it all out. The wall in the middle, you know, it had tile. And if you don't seal behind, if you don't waterproof behind the tile... Water gets in there because tile is porous. Even though you, it might be smooth on the surface, you may not think it's porous, but it is. Water goes right through it. So the walls were all rotted, and as soon as we took away the supports, basically the walls just crumbled. It's incredible. We dug up the floor, put in new plumbing. That's a Hal, another Hal <laughs> from Canada that you saw there in that picture. And we, there's, the, there's the fresh plumbing going in, and uh, there's the walls being laid out. See, it's a big room. And uh, there's Greg. He's another builder from Canada. He came and helped us put up the walls and was there for six weeks. Uh, that's one of our staff members painting the front door, renovating everything. Peter from Victoria, he came over to help out. David Nylon is our project coordinator, is putting up the drywall there. And there's Hal from Canada again, doing the plumbing. Um, when we needed plumbers, God sent plumbers. When we needed tilers, God sent tilers. When we needed builders, God sent builders. It's incredible what God does. <laughs> anyway, that fellow was from Western Australia, the one down below. He is helping there with the drywall. Oh, this is little Sarah. I thought that painting was brushes and rollers. But I've learned something, folks. Painting is far more than brushes and rollers. It's brooms sponges, and tissue paper, among other things. And it adds texture. We have textured walls now with tissue paper. Because what they do is they put 
a wet coat of paint on, then they put the tissue paper on before it's dry, and then paint over top of it again. And it creases it so that it has this texture, the random texture flowing out through the wall. The whole wall was done that way. And now we have big, beautiful mirrors on that wall. And uh, the wall still has to have some sconces put in, but it's going to be very, very nice. Liz from Canada, uh, no, from um, Malaysia. The other lady before that was from California. This is our interior decorator. We needed an interior designer, and God sent Lani. She's an interior designer from California. She's taken on this project and her heart. She's been there twice now and uh, has really redesigned the place very beautifully. You can see that each of the bedrooms is painted very nicely now. That's an example of one of them. Another wall. Each wall is different. Each feature wall is different. Each room has one feature wall. These two fellas were volunteers, the one on the left from uh, New Zealand and the one on the right from Germany. They came and uh, were helping. I don't know what they were doing there, but they were doing something. There's the ladies in the kitchen. By the way, that's my wife, Betsy, on the right-hand side, if you probably have seen her before. Anyway, there you are. If you want to contact us, you want to come down to Highwood, come uh, talk to us. We, there's our contact details. And if you want to keep up with what's going on at Highwood, go to Highwood Soul. You see the second line? Look on Google, Highwood Soul, and you'll see our alumni page there. And it's all about stuff that's going on at Highwood. It's, spiritual. it's a very spiritual uh, Facebook page, but you'll go right to it. It's open so you can go in and, and, and see for yourself what you like. And um, it is a beautiful uh, website. You'll, um, you'll get a lot of blessing out of just seeing what's going on. Keep up to date with what we're doing. All right, folks, well, let's, uh, let's get right into our message now. Sorry for, the, for how long I spoke about that, but, you know, Highwood's pretty close to my heart, and I need you to pray for Highwood. We have a lot going, and um, we are in the process of, as I said, renovating, getting ready to really take on uh, a lot of health guests that need what we can offer them.